everyone. As we take a few moments for everyone to sign on, I wanted to begin by sharing some inspiring quotes about the power of resilience. To me, being resilient is the ability to bounce back from adversity, but also to grow and learn from our challenges. Only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. This was said by Robert F. Kennedy. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. It's a great quote by Helen Keller. And Oprah Winfrey said, turn your wounds into wisdom. In the book, The Iconist, written by today's speaker, Jamie Mustard, in one of the earlier chapters of the book, Jamie leads with this great quote by Cecil Beaton. Be daring, be different, be impractical, be anything that will assert integrity. This is the time to be creative, caring, and optimistic, and turn our beliefs into a positive future. Welcome again. This is Aquatox by the Estates at Aqualita, the world's finest residences. My name is Alexandra Wensley, and I'm Vice President of Communications for the Aqualita brand. Thank you for being with us. Aquatox is our forum to bring inspiring and thought-provoking topics that will help us learn and grow together. We're committed to bringing you engaging and rich content so we can all succeed and move forward together. Today, we're going to learn how to boil your sales message down to a monolithic simplicity based on the emotional concern of the buyer. So you can increase attention, customer connection, and ultimately sales. Our speaker is an expert on perception and popular culture, a strategic multimedia consultant, art, design, and product futurist, creative artist, and iconist. He has codified the primal laws of what makes anything iconic, the anatomy of what causes any idea, art, or message to stand out and take hold in the human mind across any platform or medium. His passion is to teach the science and art of obviousness, helping professionals, artists, and businesses confidently and at will make their messages, brands, and ideas stand out to their desired audiences. A graduate of the London School of Economics, his work has spanned some of the world's leading companies, technologies, artists, designers, creatives, nonprofits, and the globe, including such prestigious companies as Intel, Cisco, Adidas, and TEDx. His purpose is to share the power of getting attention. I'm excited to introduce our speaker who loves helping people become more successful. Now, together with me, please wave your hands and help me welcome Mr. Jamie Mustard. Jamie? Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was quite the intro. Thank you so much for having me. You're Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I, I can feel your hands waving, even Yay. though I can't see them. Oh. Well, Jamie, everyone, Jamie's joining us from Portland, Oregon. So it's kind of early there, isn't it? It is uh, a little early, but I'm an early, I tend to be an early riser, so it's okay. I, I enjoy it. I'm at my best in, in the morning. Good, good. Okay, yeah, well, we're yeah. excited. Um, before you begin, I just want to let everyone know a recorded version of this webinar will be made available on the Estates at Aqualina's Instagram and Facebook accounts. Um, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us any comments, questions in the chat room, and I will be sure to address your questions when I come back at the end for Jamie's talk and our Q&A together. So please stay through until the end and engage with us. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Alexandra. Hello, everybody. Again, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here to be speaking on behalf and in, co in collaboration with this brand, which I greatly respect and admire. Uh, before we start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself so you can know where I come from and uh, how I ended up here. I, I grew up in inner city Los Angeles uh, as a in poverty as a child of neglect. I didn't get to go to I didn't go to school a lot. I had a lot of adversity 
to overcome. And I eventually uh, graduated from uh, the London School of Economics. And now I work with some of the leading CEOs, companies, artists, designers in the world on standing out based on primal laws. Um, uh, Bill Taylor, the uh, uh, one of the co-founder of Fast Company, when he uh, uh, gave me a, when he read my book and endorsed my book, he said that scarcity of attention is the defining business challenge of our time. So what does that mean? Um, it means that in a world overloaded with content, anything busy gets instantly discarded. Um, so one of the things that you have to realize is that if you're trying to get attention, attention being the most important commodity that you need if you want to sell anything, if you don't have someone's attention, there's no platform in which to start. And even though I don't know any of you, I guarantee all of you, 100% of you, are dealing with that as a primary problem. And I know that many of you ask yourselves, you know, if I could just have this person's attention, if they were being, if they could just give me 10 minutes of their time and they could understand me, um, I know for certain um, that they would be interested in my offering. And that's the biggest problem we have. We have all these incredible things that we offer the world, but uh, it's harder, it's become harder and harder in the last 20 years since the, 25 years since the rise of the internet to grab attention. I call this problem uh, dilution. And again, in a world overloaded with content, anything busy uh, gets instantly discarded. If you don't grab your customers immediately, you could lose them forever. That's what it means to try to message in the modern world. So but, but I, I am going to give you a solution for this. Um, toward, um, in the second half of this talk, we're gonna talk about this concept of blocks. What causes something to magnetize attention and become iconic in the mind of any person that you're trying to communicate to, which you can do in five minutes with deliberation and at will, rather than decades with, at, with hope, luck, or chance. Uh, you can actually magnetize attention at will, and we will get into that in the second half. But first, before we do that, I want to talk to you about this concept of dilution so that we can really understand the world that we're all trying to communicate and and sell things in. Uh, so what is uh, dilution? Dilution is uh, that uh, if you were trying to sell a piece of real estate or trying to sell anything in 1950, you were competing with the five other real estate agents in town. Today, because of content bombardment, we're dealing with thousands of, of other agents and thousands and thousands of messages all vying for the same person's attention and that greatly changes their ability to focus on one thing and definitely to zero in on you. To give you uh, an example of this, um, and you know, just to make it real, think about it like this. Uh, say I was a baker and I made cakes in 1950 and I walked around in my daily life, I was bombarded or hit with about 250 advertising messages a day between the television and just going to and from work. By 1970, that was 500 advertising messages a day. By 1998, it was five to 7,000 advertising messages a day. And today estimates with, with the rise of social media since 2007, um, estimates are somewhere between 10 to 15,000 advertising messages a day. So th this is the world in which you're trying to communicate and get the attention to customers or even have any sort of uh, conversation with the customer. I call this dilution because as all of that content rises, you have become smaller. Uh, another word, uh, another way to think about this is in 1998, there was a woman doing research for Microsoft and Apple, her name uh, named Linda Stone, and she coined the term continuous partial attention. This is 1998, before the internet was barely in full swing, she coined the term continuous partial attention to, to describe how people are only partially paying attention. Now, if we're talking about people, your customer, potential customers being hit by 15 to, you know, 1,000 messages a day, well, a human being couldn't process 1,000, okay? So, uh, again, how do you get attention when people are so overloaded? Well, the first thing is you, 
is to not just look at it from the point of view of yourself and how difficult it is to grab the attention uh, of others compared to the way that it was uh, 25 years ago. Uh, one, one key way to look at it is to look at it from the point of view of your uh, customers and, um, uh, and what they're going through in terms of trying to, uh, in, try, in terms of trying to find you. So it's not just about you being deluded, it's about them having too much choice. And there was a book that came out in 2004 by a guy named Barry Schwartz called The Paradox of Choice that basically um, talked about how um, the, the mental effects of having too many options. So your, your customers also don't know how to choose because now because of the internet, instead of having 10 options, they have 10,000 and there's actual negative effects come back. They don't, they feel paralyzed and don't make a choice at all. Um, they feel anxiety about choice. When they do make a choice, they feel dissatisfied and they can ultimately even feel depression about choice. This is the world that we're trying to sell in. So one of the things that you can do, and we're going to get into this when we start talking about blocks, is you can make that you can, by using these primal laws that I'm going to talk about, you can make it really easy for your, you to be the first and only choice for your customer. You want to be the first choice. And because everyone else is leading with something so busy, you can learn, use these primal laws and become the, the, the choice that everyone magnetizes to. So, um, the, you know, the, 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 first, the first thing that I talk about is you have to communicate uh, with oversized imagery. And then that's what brings people into your more, the co more complex parts of who you are. Your more complex, um, all the vast things that you need to tell people to sell them something. Um, most of us lead, lead with 10 of those things, 20 of those things. And then because it's busy, the person we're trying to talk to uh, sees nothing. You have to lead uh, with one to three things. And we know this works because when it comes to life and death, um, we always, uh, we, um, we, we always use these kind of monolithic ways of communicating. And the example I give in the book is, the, is a road sign or a warning label. It's something you can understand in your lizard brain before you have a chance to think. Um, you uh, instantly pay attention and you stop your car and you don't bump into another car or you don't drink poison. So anything that we can understand in a blink before we have a chance to think will... Um, instantly magnetize our attention. So the question is, is there something about the way a road sign works or the way that a warning label works that we can use to um, grab the attention of uh, high net worth real estate customers? And the answer to that question is um, absolutely yes. So in my book, um, I talk about this concept called blocks and they explain why we pay attention to everything. So there is, um, there's this element of why we stop and pay attention to something that applies to all things. And I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple of examples uh, that in kind of art and culture, and then I'll um, go and talk about a business example and how you can apply it directly to what you do and tell in terms of selling high net worth real estate. So let me give you an example of this warning label effect in art. If you were to think about what of all the artists in our, in, 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 in our collective consciousness across the globe that are the most known, not necessarily the best, but the most known, if you walked up to a person on the street, a working class person on the street in England that, that never knew anything about art, they, they, they may not recognize a Picasso, but they would recognize a Warhol or a Van Gogh. And the reason that is, is because Warhol and Van Gogh use this warning label concept, this thing I call a block. And all a block is, is this oversized thing that you can, un that you can understand uh, in a second before you have a chance to think that you repeat to someone. And it's the anatomy of what makes something iconic. So if I take this oversized thing and I show somebody a warning label five times in a row, um, that thing will become iconic in that mind. So a, a block is just a large oversized image or concept or idea 
that um, is an icon waiting to happen. And it doesn't, and you can icon it to one person. You don't have to try to icon to the whole world. All you're trying to do is icon to one customer and get them to magnetize and trust and fixate on you. So Warhol and Van Gogh use this in every image they ever created, whether it was uh, a Marilyn, a soup can, a Mao, uh, Warhol did this in every image. You understand you, you, you understand the image in a blink and then you can decide whether you want to look at the technique. It brings you into the specifics. Same thing with Van Gogh. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a man with a cob pipe, a star, a cafe, a starry night, a bedroom, a pair of boots, a sunflowers. You understand the image, it takes up the entire screen before you have a chance to think. Gauguin, who is one of my favorite painters, who I actually like more than uh, Van Gogh, uh, and Van Gogh's one-time roommate, uh, also used vibrant color, but the, image the imagery was dispersed and more complex. And um, that's why we, Gauguin is, lives within our collective consciousness all over the, I mean, Gauguin, Van Gogh lives within our collective consciousness all over the world, and Gauguin does not. This applies to music. And music, a block or an oversized thing that you can understand immediately is a nursery rhyme type melody over a more complex arrangement. So um, it's why in music they call you, they call it the hook because it grabs you by the throat, it pulls you in, it doesn't give you a choice. It's the reason Mama Say Mama Samu Makasa is so addictive. Uh, and three centuries earlier, um, da, 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 Beethoven's Ode to Joy uh, last three centuries. Uh, anything that you can, uh, a, a dominant nursery rhyme type melody over a more complex, complex arrangement uh, will pull you into the full complexity of the song. And this can be applied to business and it, and it can be especially applied to sales. It also applies to words and concepts. If you think about, I went to school in Europe and one of the, uh, as I said, and, and one of the, uh, the most famous speech probably in human history is the speech, uh, the I Have a Dream speech by uh, Martin Luther King, uh, which is a relatively short speech of just over 1600 words in which he repeats the words, I have a dream or let freedom ring approximately every 85 words. And the re reason that we remember um, that speech is because of the repetitive phrase and it brings into it all the vastness and complexity of the rest of the speech. So if you want people to remember and understand everything that you're selling them, you will use blocks when selling them. And again, I'm going to talk about how this can be applied to selling and real estate uh, when I, as I finish up. So, uh, you know, 23 years before uh, MLK gave that, what may be the most famous speech in human history, um, uh, Winston Churchill, June 4th, 1940, went uh, before the House of Commons and gave what his, is now known as his famous speech called We Shall Fight. Where, and that was his closer. He repeated the, the, the phrase over and over. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the streets. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight. We shall never surrender. And that speech, which was not called the We Shall Fight speech, is now called the We Shall Fight speech and is probably the, most, is the second most famous speech of the 20th century. And so this concept of the repetitive phrase, it can do more than just get something to become iconic in someone's mind. It can motivate people and it can galvanize people. That speech is given credit as galvanizing all the British people because they aired it that night on the BBC in London. Uh, it's given credit for galvanizing the, the entire British population for staying the course throughout the rest of the war. So using these emotional repetitive phrases uh, that are singular to represent you can have very powerful effects. George Orwell talked about this in his dystopian nightmare 1984, but he talked about it like it was bad. It's not bad, it's not good. Sesame Street and children's playbooks use the same thing. Uh, it's just how all human beings prefer to take in communication. And actually I would argue at, but what, what, what happens is as we get above elementary teaching, because we use these large repetitive images when we teach kindergartners, but as we get above elementary learning, we stop communicating to each other in elementary ways. And what I argue in The Iconist is that adults uh, prefer this uh, childlike and Sesame Street-like communication even more than children do. And in a world overloaded with content, if you lead with that, if you know how to construct it, and I teach that in my book, um, 
uh, you will be an oasis. It's even more powerful when people are so bombarded with everything that's so busy, they're just trying to block everything out. So um, I wanna give you a story of a business 100 years ago during a very difficult time, like now, even a worse difficult time, how a business thrived uh, creating and using a block. In 1932, in the, in the middle, in the heart, in the heat of the Great Depression, there was a man named Ted Houston, and he inherited $3,000. And Ted Houston cared about three things that he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to own and run his own pharmacy. And $3,000 was a lot of money back then, but it was in the heart of the Great Depression. And he cared about, Ted, cared, Ted Houston cared about three things. He cared about attending Catholic Mass, raising a family, and running his pharmacy. That's all he wanted for his life. And he moved to this small town in South Dakota called uh, Wall, South Dakota, and he op uh, opened a pharmacy he, with, that, with the money that he'd inherited. In the, again, in the heart of the Depression. He quickly realized that um, the town was busted broke and nobody was coming into his um, pharmacy and that he saw his life literally crumbling before his eyes. He had one thing going for him. There was an interstate that went right by the town. No one came into the town. Um, it, but one day his wife, Dorothy Houston, said to him, Ted, what is it that those people driving by in their weather, you know, uh, in their jalopies and their weather jalopies at that time, you know, what do they need more than anything? And uh, I think that they need um, cold water. For, you know, ice water. Would, if they knew we had ice water, we could draw them in. So um, uh, Ted thought that was a great idea. They constructed a massive billboard and they hauled it out to the interstate and they, uh, and they started erecting this massive billboard on the interstate that said, and again, this is before air conditioning was what it is today, right? Um, and so but they erected this massive sign this warning label, this road sign, this thing that, uh, uh, that said, free ice water, wall, drug. Um, before they could even get back to the pharmacy, they were mobbed. Today, wall drug is a uh, state and national landmark. Uh, and it is, it's a complex of buildings. It's got restaurants. It's probably the first viral business uh, in the world, but during World War II, people, the Allied forces would put up signs the distance they were to wall drug. Uh, people have taken wall drug sign, uh, pictures with themselves uh, at landmarks all over the world. And so um, the, the, the thing is to figure out what is it about yourself that is unique? That, uh, well, what is your free ice water? And I, you know, I, I actually give this, um, example in the book, a real estate example, um, where I talk about um, your customers will tell you what they care about. And, and the example I give in the book, I think is, I sit down and I want to, uh, this person tells me they want me to find them a home. And they say to me, I want a French country home. And then maybe they're talking to three other agents that they think might be looking for them, or they're looking for an agent, and they want a French country home. Well, they've told you the simple thing that they want. So what I'm saying to you is if you kept repeating that back to them, I can find you a French country home to the point where it made you uncomfortable. Um, two things happen. One is they feel you repeat it over and over. They, their confidence that you truly understand them goes way, way up. And then your responsibility to find them exactly that um, gets um, uh, reinforced. So, um, if you're looking at, if we're looking at selling a home, uh, an Aquilina estate or an Aquilina mansion residence, I mean, the people that would buy those, they're looking for five-star living year round. They're looking for, um, resort style living, um, day to day for their entire lives. The, there's a reason they're talking to you and they're looking at one of these things. And if you can figure out what that is, and you can be overly repetitive of, about it in, in a, um, you will find that they, you can grab their attention and that they will um, be magnetized to you. Uh, one thing, and you just repeat it over and over and over. And, and I can, um, 
And I give a very, very exact formula again on how to create that for yourself um, in the book. I, you know, the one thing that I would like to end with, uh, what I think is, is really important is there's a chapter in the book where I talk about um, transparency. So you can use these tools of the, the repetitive monolith um, to grab and magnetize attention, uh, but you have to be transparent and tell the truth because these, these, these primal laws of blocks, they work. So if you're not being honest, if you're not telling the truth, if you're not doing exactly what you say, um, you will magnetize that. So, um, so uh, yeah, it's very, very important uh, to be transparent and be uh, and deliver exactly what you say um, if you're going to um, use these rules. Um, I really, really appreciate you giving me this time. Uh, thank you. And I would like to turn it back over to Alexandra. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. I read your book and loved it. So I highly recommend it to everyone if you can see it here. And see, look at this. This stands out. <laughs> so yeah, this is noticeable. I'm sure you did it for a purpose. Um, so I, I highly- I, I did. I used the visual laws that I teach in my book. I used all those laws in the way the book was written. Uh, and also on the cover. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. We had one comment so far from Rosie, and she, funny enough, she said she returned from South Dakota, and the tour guide gave her the same story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very honored that I reached out to the Wall family when I was writing the book, because I there's a picture of from the 40s, you know, of the of of the of a wall drug sign in front of the Taj Mahal, this dark, really beautiful. It's in the book, and I and and asked their permission if I could use this 1940s ancient photograph uh, in the book, and they so kindly. Um, the Wall family, Rick Houston, and the and the great granddaughter, his uh, Sarah, so kindly gave me permission. So I feel uh, I got to interact with them, and I really appreciate them. That's great. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to check it out when we go to yeah. South Dakota. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll start with the question for you. Um, oh, she also just said, Waldron was amazing. What has grown there is beyond description. Great story. So, okay. So, and you can all create a wall drug sign for yourself. And that's what I'm telling you. And, yeah. and your customers will appreciate it because they're so overloaded. They're looking for that simple person that just says the thing that they want and repeats it so that they can have confidence. It's, it's almost like having... It's a, it's a Jedi mind trick without being a trick. Okay. okay. So, um, all right. So the first question, um, in today's world, everybody is their own brand. So how would you advise our broker community, all the brokers that are on the call today to think about their own personal brand? Such a great question. And here's the answer. Okay. Um, and it's the answer that I give in my book. There isn't, you know, people, there's a big difference between a block and a slogan or a tagline, a slogan or a tagline is a desperate way to get attention and they come across as desperate and they actually repulse customers. But when you see someone trying to create a horrible slogan or a tagline, it's because they're trying to find a simplicity. They know they need a simplicity. So rather than coming up with something that's transparent and, and real, they create this like salesy thing that just doesn't work anymore. That salesiness doesn't work in an internet society when people can check an, a claim in three seconds. Anything self-promotional um, uh, is repulsive. People associate self-promotion with unsubstantiated claims. Another word for an unsubstantiated claim is a lie. You can come out and tell the truth about your product or service, but no one will believe you because you're in a climate of liars. So the answer to that question is, away from a repulsive tagline or slogan, there is always an intersect point, okay, between the best that you have to legitimately offer as a person or business and what the customer or collective customers, the tribe that you're talking to cares about. There's an intersect point of the best of you and what they're looking for. And in that intersect point, is where you'll find that thing to magnify and blow up to be your block that you'll lead with to bring people into the full complexity of who you are and what you have to sell. 
I hope that answers the question. But yeah, yeah. there's an but that's there's an intersect point between like if you have more access to better, you know, I mean, I, what that would be, you know, that 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 would be different for each person, right? Based on, but but, but I can guarantee if you're selling to high net worth individuals, um, what they care about as a collective has a tribal consistency to it, what they emotionally care about, and. Uh, there's something about you where there's an intersect point, and if you blow that up and repeat it, you will magnetize them. I think some people feel um, uncomfortable, like keep repeating things. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, it's a great, that, and I talk about that in the book. When, when you keep repeating a monolithic statement that someone actually cares about, that actually represents you, it feels uncomfortable. It's kind of like I have a job where I go on stage and I'm a public speaker and I pursued that job. And I always laugh at myself right before I go up because the amount of anxiety that I experience is like, why did I just choose to do this for a living? So we all say that we want to be looked at. We all say that we want to be seen. And then when actually people look at us and they stare at us, we feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I, I, um, an iconist understands that they're going to feel this discomfort and they push past it and they repeat themselves anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you have problems um, connecting your block, like, you know, I was a kid that was that lived in invisibility, and now I'm more visible than I ever imagined, right? So my passion to help people, my passion is to really let all, you know, I learned some things that can help everyone. So my passion is that, you know, when I first started doing this business, it wasn't, uh, you know, I've been living with this idea for almost 15 years. I was practicing it for 12 years before I wrote a book. Okay. Um, and um, it, when I first started doing it, I just thought I was doing this kind of Malcolm Gladwell thing and, and I wasn't, and I was selling it. And when I first started doing it for a CEO, and I noticed this when I worked for a big fortune 100 company, or if it was a $2 million company, when I would give these guys their blocks, not their slogan, but this monolithic thing that actually represented their company that they could repeat, a remark, especially for, I, I noticed it a lot when if it was a business between, you know, one and 20 million, um, the person's face would change and they would, they would stand up straight and they would become brighter. And I would say to myself, you know, I'm not just help. This is not just about when, when you run a small business. Um, it's not just about the business. It's, it's, um, it's your kid's college. It's your mortgage. It's your life in Western society. It's how we define ourselves. When we go up to people at a cocktail party, we don't say, who are you? What are you about? We say, what do you do? So these things, I realized that, you know, this is a business tool. It's a business book, but um, I also see it as a tool for social change. I'm, de I'm deeply passionate about it. And anyone that reaches out to me will get a response from me because I like to help people. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so moving on. So if, people if everybody reads your book they've done all the work how do you get through all the clutter the, you know the digital onslaught the billions of ideas and images and data are coming at us all day long so i know you kind of you want to touch a little bit upon again about being like transparent and the authenticity yeah i mean i i think okay well one way one one i mean you know one way is to use this concept called blocks and again i if if someone is, has a hard time constructing theirs uh, they can go on my website and they can send me an email and then I will email them back and I will have at the very least a brief phone call with them. Okay. You want to share your email now? Uh, yeah. If they just go to the iconist.org, okay. uh, they can, or they Google my name, it'll come right up. They can go down to the contact page, send an email and they will get an email back from me and we can do a quick call. Great. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm not, you know, so you know, whether for, for me, if I could, you know, buy one of these like mansions that I want at the Aquilina, I'm really, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, five star living, resort style living year round, the guys that are going to be buying these things, they want a certain lifestyle year round. There's a way to talk about that. That's very transparent and open. That doesn't sound like a tagline and, and using transparency is a very powerful tool. There's a woman that I'm sure a lot of you know, one of the most popular TED Talks of all time, which is actually not a big, a big TED, it was a TEDx Houston, was given by a woman named Renee Brown. Yeah. And it's on the subject of vulnerability. Yeah, we love her. And, and coming across like a real person and not, 
And, and when you're vulnerable, you connect with people. Well, when you're selling a product or service, the corporate or selling version of vulnerability is transparency. If people feel like you're being open and you're just giving them the facts and you're educating them and you're not being salesy, that, that, that will keep them connected to you. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary. And if, if you can come up with a block statement to repeat, um, that has that feeling in it, it will magnetize attention. Again, there's billions and billions of warning labels and road signs and we, and they work every time you have to create. So what that means is on your website, don't have a slogan, but on the top, um, two thirds of your website, have that statement above everything, have it take up the entire website, the entire two thirds of your page that just the size of it, in the lizard brain causes us to go, this person is totally committed. It creates instant um, credibility. So if someone's searching for um, five-star residents in Miami, mm -hmm. um, they, and they go and 10 websites come up and you, you've optimized those keywords. And then you've got that block state, they look through the top 10 and there's one that has a block statement that corresponds to what you can actually do and what they most care about. Um, they will stick on your site and you will get a phone call. And, and because you talk to these people every day, uh, I guarantee you, they're telling you what they care about and they're, and they're repeat, those are pattern. There's one thing that you hear more and more from them that, that they're most looking for. Notice that pattern. Notice how it corresponds to what you can actually do. There you'll find your block statement. You repeat it to them over and over, they will lock on to you, you repeat it to them over and over, and it will become an icon in their mind and you will become the first and only choice every time. Mm -hmm. I love it, yeah, no, that's really clear. So you're also saying a block could also be an image as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm an art director. I, I design those images as a major part of my job every day. I work with designers and artists and I make those images. Um, because what, what happened is, you know, uh, as I started doing this for customers and I would deliver them the, co the, the conceptual content, they were like, great, now build it for me. <laughs> so, so I started, so I, that's been a large, a, a large part of my work and practice for a, lo a long time. Yeah. If you look at anything in my portfolio, go to my website, okay. And you will and see where it lands and you will instantly understand what a block image and a block statement can do together. So, yeah. No matter, okay. you know, go to my website and tell me if it makes, when you land there, if, if it makes you want to see what the content is. So again, we have to communicate very specific and vast amounts of communication to the world. We need to educate people, medicine, doctors, nurses, engineering, there's all sorts of vast things um, that we need to communicate to the world. But we have to give people a portal in which to access that. And that's what a block is. It's an entry point so mm -hmm. that people can uh, see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. in your book, The Iconist, you also talk about um, the snowball effect or the breed, I think. Yeah. I wrote it down, blocks repeatedly, repeated exhaustively everywhere equals demand. Yeah, again, and th that goes back to that point uh, that you made earlier about um, people feel uncomfortable repeating themselves, right? And yeah, right. It's, it's the same thing that people feel, again, when they walk on stage. And, but you know, and I make the, you know, again, I make this point. If you are not doing what you say, if you're not being transparent, if you're not being factual, you, you will, by using that breed, you will shine a light on that. But I basically say that if you use a block repeated everywhere exhaustively, mm -hmm. um, you will magnetize the exact person in volume, the exact person and type of persons that you want to be pursuing you and you will be eliminating uh, the people that you don't. Imagine that you're traveling down a giant super information highway and there's exits, okay? People are gonna get off at the exit that most corresponds to what they're looking for. People are looking for a road sign in, an, a, in a sea of content. So give them a road sign. One of the examples I, I give in the book is, this is the customer, like you actually, your customers are gonna almost exhale when they see your oversized block because everyone else is leading with three or four things. I've been doing industrial PR for 15 years and it was working with this industrial PR firm that I learned that I first kind of stumbled across this problem 
of leading with the busy. I, most of the people that build industrial companies are engineers that got successful. So they spend five years innovating and creating an invention. They can, it, this thing, this machine they invented does 30 things. They lead with 30 things. Their customer sees nothing. Mm -hmm. So then I would say to these guys, what do they actually care about? Well, this, this is the one thing that always gets them to buy. Okay, well lead with that, make that your block. And then once they're in, show them the other 29, right? So, so the example I give in the book, you have to really take the viewpoint of the person that's looking for you. If I have a high net worth individual and I want a South Florida lifestyle, um, I've decided I want that. I'm looking for you, but I'm looking for you in this way, okay? Um, if I throw a golf ball at you, you'll catch the golf ball. If I throw three golf balls at you, maybe you'll kind of catch the golf balls. Yeah. If I throw 10,000 golf balls to you at once, you will cower and turn away. That's the messaging overload that okay. the customer that you're trying to communicate to um, is uh, experiencing every day. So just throw, if you're the only person throwing one golf ball and it's the right golf ball, you become the first and only choice every time. What happens is, you know, we have this advertising machine of the way we've always advertised uh, for a hundred years and people just kind of continue to do it like the March of the Wooding Soul soldiers. You have to understand when the internet came in and really started to become itself in the mid to late 2000s, um, the way we bought completely changed. Okay. When now people can check a claim in 30 seconds, any claim. So any sort of advertorial thing that's self-promotional, that doesn't feel like a real communication uh, became repulsive at that point. In fact, there was a book written in the early 2000s, maybe 2004, 2002, by Al Reese and Laura Reese. And Al Reese and Jack Trout are the godfathers of American advertising. They wrote a book in the 70s called uh, Positioning the Battle for Your Mind, but basically saying that anything self-promotional, this is before the internet was rolling the way that it is now, and we had social media and social media advertising, anything self-promotional, um, repulses customers. Mm. You have to make an authentic statement based on what the customer actually yeah. cares about and what you can actually do. And yeah. if you notice, I keep repeating that and it's uncomfortable. It doesn't matter. I want, if there's one thing I want you to walk away with, it's understanding that statement. That is the takeaway from this conversation. Yeah. I was just going to repeat that back to you in my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be authentic, be transparent, know what your customers want and then give it to them and repeat it. Repeat yeah, it. and lead with one to three things. Don't lead with more than one to three things. Yes, okay, yeah. very good. Okay, um, so the last question, um, I wanna know how do you keep your mindset of being positive in these difficult times? What do you do? What? Because I talked in the beginning about being resilient. So yeah, I would love oh. to hear your thoughts. All right, well, there's two things, right? One is there, you know, is, is how I, is where I come from and how I houdini myself out of my situation. And I had lots of encouragers and help along the way. So I don't want people to think I, nobody does anything on their own. Okay. And I still have a lot of people that help me. Right. Uh, but you know, one thing that, that I had a mindset, I don't know how I got it, you know, when I was young, that if things were hard, and again, I, I have clients right now that, you know, that if they, um, own a restaurant, you know, they're shut down or they were shut down. There's nothing you can do to help them. But I had a lot of clients uh, that were experiencing massive booms because of demand that was created by the current situation. Like I have a client that's an industrial client that only makes products for your home. They couldn't land enough pallets and get enough stuff to Home Depot or Lowe's. They're doing record numbers and have been ever since all this started. So I can guarantee you there's a massive a uh, portion of your potential client as the a high net worth individual all over the world, 50% of them are experiencing more growth than they ever have before and, and have the money and, and will buy now more than ever before. So one, one, one answer to that question in the context of that, I'll say um, my, my viewpoint on anything in life is that if there's a barrier and it's impossible to do and you can't do it and it looks like you should give up, then I'm going to do double. That's just my personal view on the way I approach my life, okay? And that my PR firm that I work with, they got slammed and they lost 30% of their clients in a day. And they were, they were starting to get very worried and resilient, worried about laying people off. Mm -hmm. And I called them and I said, stop 
trying to keep those clients. Half your clients are experiencing a boom. Start communicating to the clients that are experiencing a boom. And instantly they started getting, signing more clients a month than uh, they normally did by just focusing on the fact that there was this portion of clients that were experiencing more sales than ever. And that they should, and they were telling them you should be, you should be, now that you're, you're booming, you should be promoting. So that's, so just know there's a huge portion of your clientele that are booming because of the situation. And there, and that's a, um, the second thing, uh, uh, that I so, say the question one more time with the, the mindset. So yeah, the mindset, yeah, be positive and yeah, and then the other mindset you know the other mindset of how i'm positive is i focus on creating there's a lot of negativity in the news i turn the news off and i just focus on making positive things creating positive things doing things like this not looking at all the negativity and i focus on different ways that i can put positivity into the world my entire speaking schedule got canceled i was speaking to 500 designers in texas i had a reading on the upper west side in new york i was doing a future conference with a famous architect the googleplex architect in downtown la all these amazing things my book just came out in october all the momentum got canceled my entire schedule and i could have i lost income i could have just gone depressed and been and gone woe is me you know, my agent called me right around that time and said, hey, you remember that children's book idea you had last year? I said, yeah. She said, I think I could sell that if you'd be willing to work on it. So I wrote a children's book, had it illustrated in Italy and went tunnel vision with my co-writer and partner, Shaw Thomas, um, one of my major collaborator. I said, I have help. Uh, she helped me write this book. And we, 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 uh, we had it illustrated in Italy and we just went tunnel vision. We turned off the news and tunnel vision on creating and creating positivity. Oh. And you'll find that magic happens when you do that. It's where you put your attention, Alexandra. Yes. Yeah. Where you no, put your I attention is what you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, all right. Now we all have to check out this book. Is the book published? The children's book? I'm sure many of us. Uh, it just went to market. Okay. But it's, it's about, I'll tell you what it's about. I'll give you guys a sneak peek. No, okay. I have not talked about this book publicly, but it's All called, right, we got the scoop. <laughs> yeah, so it's just gone to publishers, but it's, uh, it's called The World is Out There. And again, I co-wrote it with my genius uh, uh, business partner and developmental editor and close friend and, and artist, uh, Shaw Thomas. Um, uh, she shares the byline with me on this book, um, but it's about a talking lizard. It's about this boy that's addicted to screens in his house and his talking lizard shows up one day and tries to get him to go and look at the world. And he says, well, leave me alone. I just want to focus on my screens. And he's at first kind of interested that the kid can talk, but he quickly wants to get back to his game. So it's about this conversation about this lizard who comes from all the adventures. He starts telling him of all this kind of physical life that he's lived, like sand between your toes and smelling the salt air and traveling across the ocean and the world is out there and it's a block it keeps repeating the world is out there so it's this boy and this lizard having this dialogue and um it's funny because i talked about this book and i didn't have the time to really focus in on it because we were finally we were delivering the iconist that time last summer and it was it was the current time uh it was coronavirus covid that made my agent think that that was such an important message because everyone was locked inside, right? Yes. So again, you know, um, tunnel vision on positivity, right? Yes. Like, you know, people need, like if, if I was living in England and during this time, uh, I, I would want more than ever after the minute I could travel to um, have, a, have a mansion at Aquilina so that, so that, you know, to like, you know, get out in the world again and enjoy the sun and enjoy, um, you know, the, the, the security and lifestyle that comes with that, no matter what goes on. Right. I mean, I would like, if I tell you right now, if there's any place I'd be like to be living, uh, it's at a, an Aqualina property. And I'm not just saying that I actually mean that I probably, it's probably the best place on earth with the services that you guys offer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, well, everyone, thank you for joining us for Aqua Talks by the Estates at Aquilina, the world's finest residences. Stay positive, Jamie. That was wonderful. 
um, loved it all. His book is called The Iconis. Check it out. You can visit his website, iconis.org. Was that correct? Yeah, and again, I'm really interested. I work with a lot of um, interior designers, fashion. I work in uh, uh, I work in fashion. I work with musicians, and the, the the I wanted to say the Lagerfeld lobbies are stunning, and they're a block because all you have to do is say Lager, Lagerfeld designed the lobby, and people instantly understand what your aesthetic is and what you're going for. And yeah, they're just beautiful. And so I really I'm honored to be here because I just you guys are just. You really, from an interior architecture standpoint, from a design standpoint, I'm a design head and I'm just a really uh, big fan of, of your brand. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. We're so happy to connect with you. Um, and yeah, we hope to do more work with you in the future. You got, you got it. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you again, Alexander. I can't see any of you, but I thank you so much for coming and listening to me. And I meant what I said. If you want to talk to me, shoot me an email and I will get back to you and we will talk. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Stay safe, healthy, everyone. And we'll see you um, next time for Aqua Talks Online. Bye. Bye.